All right, I think we're going. Record. All right. All right, folks, welcome to the next Q&A segment of Chalk Talk and Ask the Coach. Today I've got Doc Chad Budick. <laughs> Doc, tell us about yourself, brother. <laughs> All right. I'm a um, strength and conditioning specialist for endurance athletes, I guess would be the best way to put that, or a strength and conditioning coach. Strength coach for endurance athletes. There you go. Athletes. Something like that. I do, I specialize in um, high intensity mixed modal conditioning for monostructural athletes. Oh my. <laughs> right? put, put that on a card. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been doing, doing this for since 2000. And where, where are we? I think oh, I've been, a, yeah, I've been a coach since 2008. I've been doing, I've been doing OCR or endurance training since 2014, yeah. I think, uh, was when I first got into it. So, which is ironic that I became an endurance coach because I mean, I can't run 400 meters and not get winded, but yeah. it's, it's one of those, it's one of those things, right? So. But yeah, so that's what I do, and I've worked with, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the best people in the world at what they do. Um, so it's you know lots. It's um, I've been very very fortunate that way, and I continue to work with some of the best in the world, and definitely best in Canada. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's good, and I operate OCR Labs. Um, which is basically just me. It's just a brand. It's just me. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's what I call what I do out of Trek Fit Lab. And uh, yeah. 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 For those of you that don't know, Chad and I, we've been working together how long now? 12 years? 2011. Is that when you started right. back? January 1st, 2011. Yeah, I thought you were like 2008, 2009. Maybe that no, was I... No, I started three months after Norris. So Norris started oh, in like wow. November. Okay. And then, I mean, I was hanging around in the evenings uh, in the December of 2010. And then I, my first official day was, was January 1st, 2011. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've been together, man. We've been this crowd a long time, man. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, right? Old dogs in the field, eh? <laughs> yeah, especially especially in this field it's like yeah 10 years is forever in this field oh if you make it to if you make it to 10 like you almost get like an og star somewhere <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i remember when i remember when bosu balls were a thing <laughs> yeah right unstable right. surface training yeah hey can i jump on a bosu ball no don't do that no. we all did something stupid like that everyone did <laughs> it's amazing yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Doc, what we'll do is uh, we'll get into like a few questions on your training philosophy and who you're working with and uh, what you uh, really dive into and what you think your specialty is. So, what's, sure. uh, what's your personal training philosophy, brother? Um, it's evolving all the time. It's, um, I would say largely I think of it like um, allied healthcare. So, like we fill – we fill the spot in sort of as like preventative medicine. And so, you know, there's every, as far as I know, there is no study that says that exercise is bad for you. That exercise makes anything you do worse. Everything that has been measured and studied says exercise makes that better. And, and I truly believe that if more people exercised, in some capacity that they would have a much higher quality of life um, and, and sort of be, you know, it's so cliche, but like, you know, you always say we want to be the best versions of ourselves. Right. And I mean, how many people can really say that they're trying to become the best versions of themselves and whichever, whichever thing it's, it's so like really what I like, I see myself as, as like akin to like physiotherapy 
and, but like on the other end of that, right? Yeah. So like, yeah. it's, you know, we're the, we're the first line before healthcare, first line before pathology. And, you know, if something, something happens to you, whatever that is, you are going to be far more likely to, to survive or do better on the other end of it because of what you're doing beforehand. And, um, and you know, there's, there's some education involved in that in the sense, like our job is not only like, like, you know, teach people how to exercise, I guess. It's like when, you know, when, when people ask you what, or like usually kids is the best way to explain it. But like when kids are like, you know, what do you do? And like, I teach people how to exercise, which sounds silly, but like most people have no idea how to exercise or like what's, and, and especially because there's so much misinformation out there. Oh my God. And so it's, it's about, you know, it's also helping like be that filter for people. Like I read this, I read that. Did you see this? And you can be that filter for people to be like, that's good. This is bullshit. You know, this is good. This is, you know, you know, it depends like, and so you can be that filter for people to help them sort of better understand all the, all the crap they, they see in the real world um, by people just trying to sell them shit. So, and like, you know, it's, it's nice. I've been lucky enough to have clients for 10 plus years, but it's, um, it's, you know, the, the, the biggest goal is to like not have clients in a, in a way, right. Like is, or like educate them enough that they can go off and do this stuff on their own. Um, Cause you've taught them everything you can teach them um, if they want to stay with you because they enjoy that time. And that's one thing. But you know, if, if you're, if you train somebody for like 10 years and then you ask them like, well, why are you doing this? And they can't give you an answer. Well, fuck, I failed. Yeah. So it's definitely interesting because I almost say that there's more, maybe not misinformation, but misapplied information yeah. than actually good, solid information. Like you really got to learn to pick and choose and, and, and go with understanding the foundation. Yeah. The science of it. And then really yeah. to follow the guys that speak that. And then yeah. you put your own twist of the art to it. And that's what I keep telling people is that, um, most coaches know the foundation of strength conditioning. It's really not yeah. hard. how you apply that science that becomes your art form. Yeah. And there's so much misapplied information out there. It's really difficult for people to sift through. It's really challenging for a lot of, the, I don't want to say the layman, but the people that don't study this on a daily basis, like yeah. us around here. Yeah. Well, even other coaches, right? Like, I mean, how many coaches have we worked with that, you know, they know everything, but they have no idea how to put it together and right? yeah. how to filter it into something that's actually useful. I think of 10 and, off the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, and it's, and that's, and that's really it, right? Like, so it's, I mean, it's at its, at its most bare, it's extremely simple. Um, but as humans, we have a tendency to get lost in the details. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it's really a matter of trying to figure out how to, to dis to distill the details for people and get them to not focus on the details. So. Yeah. Majoring in the majors, not the minors. Correct. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. How's your training so, going through all this? How are your athletes working and everything? Like, is it watching yeah. guys? Or? Most, most of the people are working. Most of them are, uh, well, most of my athletes are working. So most of my OCR labs people are still training. Um, they're like my biggest problem working with any like elite athlete or not even elite athlete, but athletes is like telling them when not to train. Right. So, um, yeah. it's, and then my PT clients, it's a slightly different story, mostly because they're not, you know, they come to see me because they won't train otherwise. Um, so I'm still seeing some of them on like zoom, zoom. Um, but uh, yeah, the with the with the athletes, we're still we're still doing programming, and I'm still open to them. I've you know I sent them all copies of the the book, um, just as a thank you for you know sort of sticking with me and and helping support OCR Labs through this, and I'll continue to offer them as much service as I can, yeah. you know via via distance and answer any questions and everything like that. So. We're still doing that and like I think like everybody like athletes athletes suffer from 
lack of motivation too. So some of them are, you know, I think we're all going through periods where you sort of struggle and everything else, but yeah. it's, um, I know, I know for myself, it was, you know, especially in the beginning and like figuring out the whole homeschooling thing and, and that is, was, um, was challenging and, and I was having a hard time finding, not finding time, but finding motivation to train. And, um, and I, so what I kind of, what I ended up doing was just kind of like really training intuitively and encouraging my athletes to kind of do the same thing, but it's, um, like, you know, we really, like, like I said this before, like we really have the opportunity because like, you know, you said like you, you don't have any powerlifting meets. We have no races. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have world championships in October, but I highly team. doubt, I had to highly doubt, and in New York. So I highly doubt that's going to happen. Um, and so with nothing like that to train for, a lot of people are like, well, what, do I, what am I doing? And, you know, we, we really have an opportunity to have like, like, um, like you said, like a building year um, where we can really like, you know, pump the brakes and take some extended rest. Like, and I mean, I always say it's better to be chronically undertrained than overtrained. And um, it's, it just sort of gives us an opportunity. <laughs> to a point. <laughs> yeah. A 20 year but, under training period isn't really an under training period, so you just don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To be slightly under trained yeah. and slightly over trained. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, we really like, you know, ha- with this sort of timeline, we can really just, like, you know, hit the brakes, take like five weeks off, like not off, off, but like, like really drop your training down and and just rest get the rest that your body probably needs that your brain probably needs because just like sleep deprivation you know most no most people who you still there oh yeah my my phone's on low power mode um it's just like chronic sleep deprivation like you know people are like or like even like you've had one or two drinks people like i'm not drunk just like sleep deprivation most people don't know they suffer some sleep deprivation and in this case too if people are overtraining they don't believe they're overtraining right because when they take time off they feel terrible um take the five take three weeks four weeks five like at this point who gives a shit we're five weeks in right and and we're, we're staring down the barrel of probably another like three to five weeks so why not take that time and 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 get some rest then start like building again right and like really sort of come into the next available season like really ready to go i mean um one of the things i tell athletes all the time and and i mean it more for races but like no one can stop time right like no matter what you're going through physical pain mental pain in the middle of a race like you know, you're carrying a 70 pound bag up a, up a ski hill at maximum heart rate, like just keep putting one foot in front of the other because time's going to keep marching on. And in this case, like this, this whole situation is going to end, right? Like it's, you can't stop time and eventually this is all going to go away. And when it does, like, do you want to come out of it thinking, well, fuck, I just wasted a year, like eating Doritos and finishing Netflix. Or like, do you want to have like, come out of it like ready to go and like having built a solid, a solid year? Like you don't have to, you know, do the whole Under Armour and Nike when you're training, when you're not training, someone else is training. But like, I mean, that shit's just meant to sell you t-shirts. Yeah. But you can still, you can still like have a solid, solid training year, building year going into next year almost like this never happened right like you know barring some sort of catastrophic injury you know we're all going to make it to 80 ish and like you know so those years are going to come and go like what do you want to have at the end of that right like it's it's funny i remember hearing a quote when i was first really into training when i was like my 20s i remember 
talking to one of the older trainers or older coaches at the gym that I used to work at back in New Brunswick. And he was like, the sooner you 20 year olds learn to lift like you're 40, everything will get easier for you. Yeah. hundred percent. Now it makes so much more sense when I'm creeping 40 and it's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 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 You need that 20 years of experience to really take a step back and go, shit yeah okay i gotta back it up a little bit adjust this a little bit like yeah like, yeah like when this all started a lot of a few of the power was like well like what about my total and i was like okay well do you have a squat cage no do you have a barbell no you got a bench no i ain't worried about your total because you ain't gonna have one you don't have anything yeah. necessary to get a total so now yeah. we have to work on work capacity which is the other end of our spectrum yeah the part where most powerlifters hate to do so there's a lot of light movements a lot of reps and stuff like that with short rest yeah. breaks. now for your athletes that can't say it's a little bit different for you because they're running and they actually have the ability to do that right now and they have the ability to sprint and climb hills and stuff whereas my don't yeah. but would you recommend for that four or five week deload for them to try something different like basketball or you know just lift weights for a week or something like that Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. And it's like, you know, the one thing's like, cause we work kind of on opposite ends of the same spectrum, but yeah. it's like, <laughs> you know, if, you know, so the average person is like 50% slow twitch and 50% fast twitch. And if you go to the extreme ends of either end, you know, maybe you have someone who's like 70, 30, so 70 slow twitch and 30 fast twitch. And on, for your people, it'd be the opposite. Right. And it's like, if you're always, training that 70 percent you're leaving 30 percent on the table so this is like 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 I said this is a great opportunity to focus on that 30 percent and let right? the other 70 recover yeah because that's a huge thing that most people don't realize if you're always training the same way eventually you start to get burned out and broken down even i do that like i yeah. i try different modalities and different systems. even i'm doing cardio right now god damn it like it's <laughs> yeah what's for a run today doc <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it's it's yeah <laughs> right you know like I'm, gravity is not my friend right now yeah. um <laughs> but it's it's like you know chris henshaw is an endurance athlete for crossfit and like he does kind of like what i do but the opposite sort of same idea it's the idea of like i dose endurance athletes with like heavy mixed modal heavy relatively speaking mixed modal work or high intensity mixed modal work as, and like as a supplement to their endurance training so mm -hmm. we're focusing on those those faster twitch fibers um, exactly and and for henshaw like one of the things like when he started working with like i mean he was working with the best in the world at crossfit like rich rich Froning, jason klepa and his whole thing was like well what if you know what if i start giving these guys pure aerobic work and they get worse and they did um, and what they actually found was that by dosing them like twice a week, like not even that much, but dosing them twice a week with pure aerobic work, all of their strength numbers went up yeah. because they were no longer neglecting a large pool of their, of their muscle fibers. Yeah. And that's generally what I would do with my power lifters. I'll give them like when they do the modified strongman stuff. So it might be heavy to normal people, but it's not heavy to them. So when they pick up yeah. like a hundred pound sandbag for your OCR athlete, that's heavy. Yeah. And for the power lifter, it's light. But yeah. when I make them walk for three minutes with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I like, I actually talk about that in the section of the book, right? I like talk and about. Um, what's the book? Sorry. What's the book for you that might not know about it? Oh, I wrote a, I wrote a training manual. We'll call it a manual. It's not a book. It's like a hundred pages. Um, a I'm training sure. manual on, on how to train for uh, obstacle course racing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's very, uh, go to my Instagram at OCR Labs Performance or at Chad Budick and follow the link in the link tree. Uh, <laughs> it's, I, it's like two bucks right now. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> if you're not seriously, if you want to know anything about OCR, like I don't think a lot of people realize you are actually one of the number one OCR coaches in the world. Whether <laughs> you admit to it or not, you actually are. So shut the fuck up. 
And <laughs> if you want to know anything about that sport, read the book. It's two fucking dollars. Dear God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, so yeah, but so there's a part in it where I talk about delivery or like limitations, um, like metabolic delivery limitations um, and the case study. And I compare like a, like a powerish athlete against a pure endurance athlete. And I give them the same, the exact same workout, right? And and it was like an hour long AMRAP, which is disgusting. I mean, to work for an hour straight is just ridiculous. For endurance athletes, though, that's nothing. That's like, oh, okay, that's a little bit. Of, that's a little more than a 10k. Um, like I don't know, right? Like exactly, right? That's that's 59 minutes and 59 seconds too long. Um, <laughs> so but it's um and it's so the the endurance athlete is a world record holder in 100 mile uh 50 and 100 miles on a treadmill and i mean this girl will run like an eight minute mile for or eight minute or seven minute mile or something to that effect somewhere in there for like eight hours straight and like that's ridiculous like that's nine miles an hour is a run like that's a run and she'll hold she'll hold that for, like faster than that for eight hours Incredible. and yeah it's crazy and um so and then the 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 cross it was the crossfit guy and so the, throughout the whole workout and they did the exact same workout with similar loads but at the end of the hour the endurance athlete the girl she's like I could have gone, I could have held that pace for like another three to four hours. And the CrossFit guy is like, I was fucking dead. <laughs> I could have, I could have done any one of those movements way faster, but it would have been over. So like at the end of the hour, he was done. Like that was it. Right. And so although, although you have two people doing two to the same workout we're looking at two different stimuli from the same workout and yeah. both athletes are getting what they need from it so the, the crossfitter is getting this endurance work so he has to dial his output way back to like his lactate balance point so mm -hmm. that he can keep going and for her she's doing everything as fast as she can but because her lactate balance point is so close to her her vo2 max that um there's not a lot of like space there so she can like exist right on that edge yeah. but for like seven hours but um what what it allows her to do is train that strength and power um in a way that she normally wouldn't get just going out and hitting the pavement for five hours yeah there was an inter interesting study i read it, it would literally probably be more than 10 years ago now about olympic class rowers and how they can squawk I think 90 to 95% of their one RM for like eight, 10, 12 reps. Yeah. But yeah. they're literally at 90 to 95%. Like you add 5% yeah. in the bar and they got one and they die. Yeah. yeah. Whereas they're... Most, most strength athletes, 90 to 95 is max three reps. And that's a big time. Yeah. Probably creeping a PR if you get four. Yeah. So yeah. it's funny yeah, it's, think about that lactic balance point in that top threshold of what you can maintain and, and hold for a long period of time. Yeah. Well, what they're, what they're seeing with things with like, um, uh, like nearest devices near infrared spectroscopy is that when you look at, when you put that on, so it's basically, it's like a little unit, like one inch by one inch, two inch by two inch. Mm -hmm. Um, and it puts, um, infrared light into the muscle. And based on the way the, um, the hemoglobin holds on to oxygen, will tell it how the muscle is utilizing oxygen. And for endurance athletes, and so like in your example with the, with the rowers, it would be interesting to have a nearest device on them because I would be willing to bet that even at like 90% of their 1RM, they're still getting blood flow to the muscle. And so there used to be this thing in CrossFit where they would call it like an NME test, neuromuscular efficiency test. And they used to like say like, oh, if you're like really strong, then you have a high NME. And if you're not like, so if you can do three reps, then you have a high NME. And if you can do like nine reps, then you have a low NME. But really what we're seeing is that those athletes 
still are getting blood flow at high percentages. Mm -hmm. So their, their muscles don't occlude blood flow. Whereas like the power athletes, their muscles are so much stronger than their heart that even at lower percentages, they're occluding the blood flow. And so really what it comes down to is it's not, it's not as neurological as we thought that it's much more cardiovascular. And so um, what they find is those athletes, like the rowers would be a good example, or like, you know, I mean, generally speaking, you know, to, to generalize, if you have like ectomorphs, ectomorphs require much more volume at a much higher percentage of their one RM than what our textbooks would have told us. Right. So it's cause it's like, Oh, like they might need, they may need like 15 to 20 sets at like 95% of their one RM. Um, because it takes that long to get the to get the adaptation that they're looking for whereas like you know you or i would just fucking implode under that kind of volume yeah right and so what you'll see is is like your athletes for example if they could be getting anaerobic adaptations to aerobic stimuli simply because their muscles are occluding blood flow oh shit i got to try to hold on Pause. I have to try and switch back to uh, Wi-Fi because I'm using up all my data. Oh no! Oh no! Where is my thing? There we go. Wi-Fi, connect, please. How did you get the okay. TrackFit Lab watermark? <laughs> Do I have that? Yeah. Huh. I don't know. <laughs> all right, are we back? There we go. I don't know. Did it just did it come up with that? That's weird. Yeah, it know. comes up with TrackFit Lab watermark. <laughs> oh, cool. That that seems like a Chris Liu thing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. He must maybe he hacked my phone. <laughs> he hacked your phone. The IT guy hacked your phone. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So what they see is like with, with powerlifters or like strength athletes is they actually end up getting adaptation like um and they still get anaerobic adaptations to aerobic work because um because their muscles are occluding blood flow. So like, you know, depending on the athlete, if they go for a run even at a run, depending on the athlete, the muscles could be contracting to the point where they're occluding blood flow. And so even though the run is supposed to be aerobic in nature, they're getting anaerobic adaptations. Like even one of my OCR athlete girls, when we looked at, when we looked at her numbers and everything, we tested her, she could do no intensity greater than a walk that wouldn't push her past her lactate balance point. So even uh, so even when she was doing, like when she raced, she was always like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. But she could sprint like nobody's business. And then she would need like crazy amounts of time to recover. And I remember a race in Montana last year, she looked fresher at the finish line than the girls that won. But that was just because she would go up and then have to recover and then go up and have to recover. And at any point, like I said in the, the other sort of case study is she could go way faster at any point but she was riding that line, right? And so for her, like her training would look like, you know, she was actually getting really bored at the beginning of the year because the, in the winter she couldn't, we wouldn't allow her heart rate to go over like a 150 or whatever. So she could, because as soon as it went past 150, that was probably pushing her over her lactate balance point. And then she's no longer training her aerobic capacity, right? She's the training- Capacity versus the anaerobic ability. <clears throat> exactly and so um and so like i always use like this bathtub analogy right like so intensity is like a bathtub or like your intensity is the water coming in the bathtub and then you know the bathtub fills and the drain is how fast you can clear lactic acid and most people focus when they're training intensity they're focusing on how much water they can put in the bathtub when <clears throat> really one of the things you want to focus on is how much how much water can you get out of the bathtub right? Because the more water you can get out of the bathtub at a time, the more intensity you can pour in. Well, I always explained to her that she basically had like an Olympic sized fucking swimming pool worth of capacity for lactic acid with like this tiny little drain. So she could pour tons of intensity in for a while, but then all of a sudden that pool was full and she couldn't do anything else. Yeah. <clears throat> really what we want is like a household bathtub with an Olympic sized drain. Yeah. The complete opposite. That way, you can actually continuously move without breath, without break. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's funny. So. And it's funny because I told my powerlifters like a lot of the time. It's like a lot of the time I tell my strength athletes, like you need to be fit to be strong. 
and they don't quite get it. Yeah. Because a lot of them say, oh, running, 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 it's fucking bad for me. It's going to get my numbers down. Well, at the wrong time of the year, yeah, it'll cripple your numbers. But in a recovery period, having a better aerobic base will make you an exponentially better power lifter, better strength athlete. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because you're not, A, hammering the same uh, C, uh, part of the CNS. You're giving that a bit of recovery time. Then you're working on different fiber thresholds. Yeah. And then yeah. all of a sudden, now you get a bigger base. So say you take your like 3RM and back it off and work on 10s. Well, that yeah. 10 is giving the three fibers a break. And that's the simplest way I can explain it to people. It's like, you've got to give them a breath of a breather. And then when you step back, all of a sudden your three is not your five. Your three is yeah. your five. Your two is probably your three. And your one is probably a two or a three. Like, yeah. Um, and like, for a, um, that's charging, especially for a, um, for something like a, um, like a multi-day event, right? Like the better, the better adapted your aerobic system is, the better um, you're going to be able to clear the byproducts from your warm-ups and then your actual uh, lifts. Because then the aerobic system, I mean, <coughs> slow twitch muscle fiber likes lactic acid. I mean, it'll choose lactic acid as a fuel source over a sugar. And so if you can give it what it like, if you can develop that aerobic, um, that aerobic base, it'll help, you know, those second and third lifts, right? <clears throat> yeah. So that recovery, the faster you recover, the, fa the heavier you're going to lift. It's real simple. Sorry, say it again. As the faster you recover, the bigger you're going to lift. Yeah. I wonder why I can't hear you all of a sudden. It's because you're old and deaf. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I plugged you in for to like get some power, and now uh, now I can't hear you. <clears throat> That's the problem with the uh, the lightning adapter is you can only have one thing in at a time. Nice. <laughs> so. uh, no, that's pretty cool. It's a. Uh, it's always fun to to talk on the opposite end of the spectrum because it's so there's so much carryover and crossover and most people don't realize that if you're always over here and you're neglecting this this is going to start to beat you up after a while and if you go over here for a little bit and then come back this just jumps up and vice versa same with your end if you're always over here your athletes start to get repetitive stress issues just like mine would yeah you're banged up your body you're, you're just a too you're in too much of a catabolic state all the time you have yeah. to go into an anabolic state to break down well ours is the opposite opposite side of the spectrum we're always in trying to be in an anabolic state. It eventually will become catabolic to us. Yeah. So it's that whole, you have to understand that there's times you have to go into the heavy or go into the endurance and then back out of it. Yeah. And you can do it and then back out of it. And yeah. if you understand that those who train the longest get the strongest or become the best or the fastest or the most endurant. Well, if you're always injured, you're definitely not going to be training the longest. Yeah. So Sorry. it's hard for people to understand like what the way I trained when I was 20, if I tried to do that again, I would die. Yeah. Like I just can't do that volume. I can't do that. Uh, those same patterns all the time. So I have to frequently take a step back and then go back into it and take a step back and go back into it. And you kind of like seesaw back and forth. Powerlifting is the same as I'm assuming it'd be the same as endurance for you guys. If you guys always ran the same circuit, the same way, the same time, your knee, your back should be shot to hell. Yeah. No, is that, and like, it's funny. Um, I mean, you have to do it for like longevity in the sport, regardless of what the sport is. I know there's this, <clears throat> there's these coaches that I listen to who taught like do ultras. So yeah. ultra, ultra is technically anything over a marathon, but these guys talk about like hundred milers and stuff. And it's funny cause they talk about like cross training and it's, they did a whole like, talk about you know is cross training beneficial which drives me crazy because of course it is but um there it's the whole point of accessory work in cross training is to allow is to supplement and to allow you to continue to to focus on on that thing that is yeah. like your your focus right and so it's like it's it's you almost want to think of it as like when you hyper specialize whether that's endurance or power, like you're all by, by its very nature, you are creating imbalances and ignoring a whole other host of things. 
and the cross training or whatever that is is meant to supplement or like to reef like to to like go in and sort of fill in those gaps as best as you can and uh, whether whether it's like doing some endurance work for powerlifters or if it's doing strength work for runners um but it's it's like the, it's just funny how resistant people who do that stuff are to doing it and just so, and also like you know um like even other coaches like other like like athletes and stuff like that who are just like you know like powerlifters versus crossfitters versus strong men versus oh, endurance yeah. like mm-hmm. we're, we're you know you know we're all doing the same thing and can all learn from other people and understand that other people are doing you can like you can learn stuff from that and then apply it to what you do and it'll probably help your athletes like yeah. what's what's the point of like sitting there and you know i saw <clears throat> i saw this thing and I'm, I'm sure it was supposed to be satire someone sent this video to me of this guy comparing comparing metal plates to bumper plates <laughs> and uh and he's just like you know basically like lift metal plates because that's what real men do and only pussies lose these things and blah, 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 blah. And, and and i was just like i don't think this dude could spell satire like i don't like i don't think that's i don't think i don't think this dude actually gets it and so i was like i was i was mad because i'm fine when it is satire and these guys are just like look we're all doing the same thing and i'm just kind of making fun of my own people but this guy wasn't doing that and i was i was like the person who sent it to me was like, oh, I thought it was hysterical, but I was like, I was like shaking mad. <laughs> but it's just like, right? Because it's like everything I'm, I stand against and strength and conditioning, right? Like, so it's, yeah. and, and everything I'm trying to educate people on, right? Like, because I mean, especially being a CrossFit coach and like, it has like such a, a stigma in, in what we do and like, and then especially in endurance and stuff like that and like you know i almost can't even call it crossfit so it's like you know what do you do yeah, mixed modal conditioning <laughs> what's that crossfit high intensity right. high intensity function movements for the work capacity load <laughs> yeah high high intensity interval training yeah. so but it's it's like you know i I think you'd be hard pressed to find a single person at OCR labs last year who didn't PR. Right. And, and, you know, that is less to do with me and more to do with just like, they're now dosing themselves with the stuff that they, they were neglecting for so long. Right. Like I had, I had one guy, he did, um, I'm sure if it was a marathon, a half marathon. It was a half marathon, but he PR'd his time on every distance. So like 5K, 10K, 15K, and half marathon time, he PR'd every single one of those times. And it was like, and that was just because instead of just running, he was now doing some mixed modal work, right? And Picking something up and carrying it, pushing yeah. something, dragging something. Yeah, and it's it's weird how that you know. I mean, I say weird, but I'm being sarcastic. Yeah. Um, it's 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 weird how doing that improved just his straight up running, and you know, yeah. If you take people that just lift weights and get them to go do some running or rowing or biking, they're going to get better, right? Yeah. So, you know, and it's it's a fundamental basis of CrossFit, but it I think it would apply to any sport and any physical endeavor. Is like, is you know, they, everyone, you know, there's the hopper model in CrossFit where you're like, you know, you put anything you can think of, nothing is excluded. Everything goes in the hopper, whether that's, you know, a hundred mile run or a one RM deadlift, doesn't matter what, and everything in between, it all goes in the hopper and you turn the hopper. While that hopper is turning, every single person in the room is going to have one thing where they're like, please, sweet Jesus, don't let it be this. Yeah. Right. You will get better if you chase headlong that thing you don't want to come out of the hopper, right? And if you get better at that one thing, you will get better at every other thing you want to do, right? Yep. So, it's you know, if you're, it. yeah, right? Because you're, no, you're, you're not neglecting that stuff. And you don't have to do it all the time. You just need to dose yourself with it once or twice a week, you know, depending fact, on your training. you're actually body. really, really good at it. You should probably do less of it and you'll yeah. get way better at it. And do yeah. the other shit that you're really bad at. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably improve everything. Yeah. Well, and like it's stress tone, right? Like I actually tried to do a video on it this morning, but I just tripped all over my words and it was stupid. Um, but it's like when your training volume is super high, right? Especially if it's super high in one thing, adding another training stimulus on top of that isn't really going to mean anything. And so in order to get anything out of it, that training, that new training stimulus has to be so much more intense. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so if you can lower that, right. Cause like it's, it takes a long time to get a training quality. And, but once you have that training quality, be it strength or five minute mile or whatever, yeah. it doesn't actually take that much training to maintain yeah. that thing. Right. And so like, like to your point, like you need the, the minimum effective dose to maintain strength. And then you go on and, um, and you, you train other stuff in order to get better. I mean, like, I don't have a great, like, you know, for a 42 year old who like hardly trains, I mean, my deadlift's okay. But like, um, there was like, when I was 30, I couldn't deadlift 300. Um, now I'm probably like a 350 to four, depending on the day. But, um, but I can pull 300 any given day of the week. And I, I, I can count on one hand how many times in a year I deadlift even close to 300 pounds, right? Yeah. So like I can deadlift, you know, upwards of 85 to 90% of my one RM on any given day, um, almost cold, but I never train it because I dose my body with enough strength to maintain that quality. If I wanted to get, you know, a 500 pound deadlift, that has to spend a lot more time trying to build that up. But, um, you know, the, the, the point is like, once you, once you get something to a certain level, you don't need to train it all the time in order to maintain it. It just needs no. to be once in a while. Um, and that's, I think where a lot of people go wrong is they're just terrified that if they stop, it's all going to go away. Um, go lifting or running or sprinting. Yeah. Or no, exactly. Right. Like people are like, Oh, if I stop running, like I'm not going to be able to run like five miles or what, or like, you know, have this, this time rate. Right. Um, and really like, like that's, you know, I mean, even the research shows that that's not true. Even a little bit of dosing, um, will maintain, will maintain your speed and everything else. And, um, you know, I think my phone's going to die soon, but I'll drop this story real quick. Um, when I was training Faye and for those who don't know, especially if you're powerlifters, Faye Stenning is one of the best Spartan racers in the world. She was ranked number one in the world in 2016, 2017, I think. She's the most winning Spartan racer in the last decade. Um, but when I was working with her, she would come in once in a while and I would give her these absolutely horrific workouts, like completely soul crushing. I would not prescribe them to anyone else in the world. They're really bad. Um, but they were necessary to do that. Um, because her training volume was so high at the time. And so for us to get anything out of that, out of those training sessions, I, yeah, exactly. I had to like practically kill her. And there was one time where she's like, you know, dragging a sled down a farmer carrying at the same time and all this other stuff. And she's like drooling down her chest and like, like barely breathing. And someone, someone nearby was like, that dude is legit trying to kill that girl. And you it was with that level. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, in, in retrospect, you know, that was in 2016, she took uh, third at world championships that year. Um, in retrospect, you know, like, yeah, I, I had to, but probably, you know, in, in, you want, you don't want to get to that point. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, you want it, you want to get to a point where you don't have to die in those training sessions, but, um, but they, they were necessary because there was already so much there, right? When you're training three times a day, seven days a week, um, it's like those, those sessions have to be just so over the top in order to, to even bother doing them. And so, um, the needle yeah. At all. yeah, exactly. So, I know that was a weird tangent. I don't even know where I was going with that. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll leave it there, Doc, because I know your phone's yeah. about to die. We'll have to do a yeah. part two sometime because I'm sure there's a sure. few more questions we can dig out of a few things. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>
All right, buddy. Uh, All where right. if you want to follow you and find you, where they, where they hook you up? Hit you up. Uh, so OCR Lab, where are we here? OCR, at OCR Labs Performance on Instagram and at Chad Budick on Instagram as well. They're kind of, one's my semi-personal and one's 100% professional, but they both have the link tree to all my blog articles, videos, and book manual. Cool. Yeah. Well, folks, there you are. It's probably an hour with Doc. And uh, we'll have another one probably in the next few weeks because what else are we going to do right now? Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Other than that, brother, I'll end this, but stick around for a quick All second. Right. Yeah, sure.